Hello, everybody, and welcome to Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 32. So we're going to go with Jeremy for the Bibcot NoGov license. Yes, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the Bibcot NoGov license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at bipcot.org. So today we have uh, uh, an illustrious guest, uh, Lawrence Reed. I had the pleasure of, of interviewing him uh, recently, and he's most gracious as to come on to our show, Seeds of Liberty. So we're happy to have him. Um, so so uh, Lawrence has been, so, so just to run, run real quick, he's president of uh, Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, he's a volunteerist libertarian, and you can find uh, information for that on uh, fee.org, F-E-E.org. Um, and uh, so, so today we're going to discuss some of his articles from the Real Heroes series that he's been writing for Fee, uh, which comes out every Friday. Um, maybe we'll. Uh, so, so some of the ones that we that we read um, were a life devoted to the freedom of others. Um, I think that's Thomas Clarkson, is it? Right? Yes, it is. I think so. And uh, missionary for free markets, and God's forgotten libertarian. And uh, and Jeremy has read um, home education inspires a love of learning and anti-war hero. So, um, you know, we'll get into some interesting topics. Awesome. So, um, uh, Lawrence, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, Danilo and Jeremy and Dave, I'm uh, honored that you would ask me and looking forward to the show. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. So, so yeah, I, um, I, I, uh, I didn't know about The Real Heroes when I uh, interviewed you, but I guess you were doing it right at that time. You, you had started yes. before. And so, uh, yeah, really awesome series. Um, you know, you talk about a lot of people that are... Um, you know, the unsung heroes of liberty, right? We always hear about, you know, Frederick Bastiat and Rothbard and, um, you know, Hazlitt and Hayek and the big names, right? But then there's people who have done much but have not really received recognition. So uh, it's awesome that you've been writing this series on them. Oh, but thank we'll... you. And you're exactly right. I, I try to find people who aren't well known. Although you mentioned Frederick Bastiat, I can give you a heads up on the fact that tomorrow morning, that's the real hero for this Ooh, week. Ooh, so, I gotta read that oh. one. <laughs> I like Excellent. Bastia. I'll, I read I'll the be law. looking forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh, was... great. Yeah. The, well, the as, wheel gets as, all as the credit. As, as, the as... grease never gets any. <laughs> so I like this article. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Bastia. Uh, I guess I don't know. Maybe in the in the really uh, you know um, profoundly you know philosophical libertarians they're familiar with Bastia, but I guess you know definitely in government schools <laughs> you know they don't even they don't even they didn't even mention anything about him, so uh, yeah, definitely I would say unsung. Um, would so, so yeah, so please tell us a little bit about um, of uh, Thomas Clarkson. Um, I, I remember reading. I think I think uh, he was the beginning of the abolitionist movement, was it? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Thomas Clarkson is one of my favorite people of all time. In fact, one of my two dogs uh, is named for him. Nice. Mm. Uh, <laughs> his name is Cl is Clarkson. Uh, he was born in 1760. And in the 1780s, he was a student of theology at uh, Cambridge University outside uh, London. And he was uh, studying to be an Anglican minister. That was his intention. Uh, but he entered a contest that was uh, offered by uh, Cambridge every year, open to students. And they had to write their essays as a part of this contest in Latin. And in a particular year, I don't recall exactly what year, but early to mid-1780s, uh, the subject was slavery. And the resolution that the students had to write their essays about was, this was pretty close to the exact wording, uh, resolved that it is wrong for one man to own another. Now, we take for granted today that that's, that's a long ago resolved issue. But at the time uh, of this uh, famous essay contest, most of the world had accepted slavery. It had been practiced for centuries, uh, Great Britain in particular, where uh, Thomas Clarkson was born, was the biggest single practitioner of the slave trade. And there were a lot of people in Britain making money off of it. So uh, he writes this essay, and in the process, uh, he does a lot of research and comes to some pretty uh, powerful conclusions and learns a great deal. And he writes this beautiful essay. You can still read it. It can be found online today that basically says slavery, this institution that so many people accept today as if it's nothing, is really a cruel and inhumane institution. It's a blot on the British conscience and uh, must be done away with. 
Well, he does more than just write about it. He's so bothered by what he learned in the process of researching for this essay that uh, a couple years later, he forms the world's first think tank. Uh, it was a single issue think tank, but that's exactly what it was, an organization devoted to changing public policy to get the slave trade abolished, but uh, recognizing that they had to change public opinion first. Uh, it was called the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, and uh, he and his compatriots fought hard for 20 years, uh, and that's a long story. If you want to get into it, we can, but lots of uh, exciting developments along the way until they finally convinced Parliament in 1807 uh, to abolish the trade in slaves. Uh, but that wasn't the end of it. For Clarkson, that was really just the beginning. Uh, ending the trade in slaves didn't liberate anybody. It didn't free anybody already enslaved. So he immediately began to mount, mount the bigger effort, was, which was to abolish slavery itself. And that took another 26 years. So for him, this is 46 years of his life. Yeah. Uh, but he ultimately succeeded in 1833. Sounds like the uh, story of protectionism and revolutionary ideas is always, it's just a cycle that keeps repeating. Oh, yeah. absolutely. You when know, you say it's... protectionism, that was another great battle in Britain early in the 19th century uh, to end the tariffs against the importation of grain, all the protectionist devices that uh, benefited the uh, wealthy landowners in Britain. Uh, so that was going on while Clarkson was still alive, too, and that was ultimately uh, victorious in 1846. Yeah, I, 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 it is parallel to me to this the, to the slave trade. You know, the people who own slaves are protecting their profits from owning slave. You know, and that's it's right. A, so it's it's just protectionism, and and it just goes to show you like how far people will use any means necessary, especially when there's that tool there of government to protect uh, what they think is is rightfully theirs. And when you're when you del delve into this scary thing of you know it's not really it shouldn't be that scary to us because for the majority of mankind slave <laughs> slavery has existed we're, yeah. we're, we're we're on the other end of the timeline you know the the cutoff point we're on the other end you know and that that mm -hmm. posts are the pre abolition timeline is much much longer so it's yeah. uh it's a new idea to human and i still think you know with democracy and statism it is slavery. It's just a different name. A lot of people don't realize that what it is. And when we bring these ideas to light and make people realize, you know, that, that this government force uh, is is the problem. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's that's all we that's all we can do. You, we can only rationally fight the system. You can't fight it with bare knuckles. <laughs> that's that's right. And uh, you touched on something, Dave. That's very important for people to know, and that is that slavery could not have thrived. Uh, for all the centuries that it did, had it not been for uh, the force of government backing it up, uh, uh, protecting it, giving it sanction, uh, going after people who uh, uh, may have uh, tried to liberate slaves uh, and returning them by force to their slave masters. Uh, government force uh, was indispensable uh, to um, to slavery, and using government to get rid of it was important too because as Clarkson knew, they had to get the government out of the business of supporting slavery and get it to actively end it and to recognize that it's uh, morally wrong for one person to apprehend by force and then claim to own another person. Well said. Yeah, this, yeah, this I, I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to, to read this article yet, but it's funny, I was just, I was just glancing over it quickly and it, it mentions that, I mean, he pretty much, you know, he, you were saying he led the charge, you know, in England for this and then he brought it to, uh, what's his name, uh, William Wilberforce, who is the, right. the one, <clears throat> who is the man who was in Parliament, but most people don't even know his name. Yeah. So it's 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 really kind of getting into the weeds to pull out to put to get down to Clark. So which is great, though, because I mean, I, I love this type of stuff because the history was my in to, to volunteerism and, and anarchism. That's how I, I I found all this by by digging deeper and deeper. So I, I like fighting all these things. But it's it's funny because you, you see this and then, you know, like like David said, you know, we are on the on the short end of the stick as far as, you know, 
being away from slavery, you know, versus the thousands mm -hmm. of years that it's been. Although it, the case can be made that it still continues just in the it, it in does. A, in no, a no, and, and hardcore well, slavery is, still does as well. well yeah, because it's, it's it's chattel it's tax, slavery. Yeah. Well, it's tax slavery, which is what we've yeah. I think we've discussed. No, there's the show legitimate actually... chattel slaves in India and in well, no, you no, know, I, Sri Lanka I, I, and I, you know. I, no, I understand. I was refer. I was referring to like here, you know, what, no, yeah, what we yeah. have to deal with. Of course. And it's it just funny because most people, like you said, they they're repulsed by the idea. But again, it went on for a very long time, and yeah. even most people who see it gone here and like, oh, it's it, you know, of course it's a good thing, but they don't recognize that you know, while here it took a bloody, so, you know, so-called civil war to 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 to, to purportedly end it. Um, there in England, you had people like Clarkson and working with Wilberforce, and they were able to stop the whole thing. I mean, it still went on longer than it should have everywhere, but that's, yeah. you know, it's it's the whole people. I mean, I guess technically, in in the in, at the time, the state actually was doing a bang up job of protecting property rights <laughs> by doing well, that because yeah. people considered them properties. So technically, I guess that's one for the state. You know, that's <laughs> the, the right, one right. the one time they do an excellent job at protecting property is whether it's stuff they've confiscated or if it's another human being. Sure, we'll take care of you. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a it's point. all about lobbying oh, I, power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very ironic. You know, it's sad too when you look back. Uh, slavery had been commonplace for centuries, and it, it's only been a couple of centuries since the, these great developments that Wilberforce and, and Clarkson pioneered in Britain and ended it, and yet they're largely forgotten today. Not many people know it, and, and these are two of the greatest humanitarians in all of history, mm -hmm. and they were with yeah. us not all that many decades ago. Yeah, and, and one thing I like to uh, talk to people, you know, like I like to mention when, when I talk about, um, you know, the, pon the possibility of voluntary society or stateless society, and, uh, you know, they say, you know, well, what about, you know, who's going to feed the poor, who's going to build the roads, who's going to, you know, protect, you know, people? Um, and it, and it, to me, it's like I, I, I say, imagine you're an abolitionist in the 19th century, and, and the, the slave masters are giving you the same exact argument. Who's going to pick yeah. the cotton, right? That's right, exactly. And, and so I tell people that, you know, it's not that we can predict the future. Like I don't know what inventions are gonna uh, spring up because regulations are suddenly, um, you know, dissipated and, and there's no more hindrance to, uh, you know, to entrepreneurs. I don't know what's, what people are gonna create. I can't predict. We're not oracles or fortune tellers, but we we are volunteers on moral grounds, right? And same thing with abolitionists. There's, you know, you you want the slaves to be free on moral grounds that you know you cannot own another human being. But maybe they they did not foresee, you know, the um, the huge industrial machines that would pick, you know, harvest the crops yeah. and pick the guy yeah. and do that. <laughs> it's not necessary to, do, to predict. Yeah, ours is a moral argument. You're absolutely right. If somebody came to us and said, well, but uh, using slave labor to pick cotton will make our clothes cheaper, uh, I would say, I don't care if it makes them free. The fact is, it's <laughs> utterly immoral uh, for one person to claim ownership of another against his will. So, uh, ours is a moral argument first and foremost, not an economic one. Yeah, that um, who will pick the cotton phrase? You know, the first time I heard it was Larkin Rose, and it, it, I mean, the nail was already in the the coffin on my <laughs> statism, but that was really like the holy crap, you know, like the it makes all set like all arguments for the state can be rebutted by who will pick the cotton. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Literally, it literally, literally. I think we need more pithy phrases like that that cause people to think and realize maybe something that they've accepted was is fundamentally false in its premises. Oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. So, um, so please, um, me, and, m Jeremy, and I both have uh, you know young children, uh, and we we both plan on homeschooling, you know, slash unschooling. So, so please, can you talk about your your homeschooling article? And and uh, Jeremy told me that you uh, that that's the only one that you did not. Um, you know, have one specific hero. You know, you consider all homeschooling parents to be heroes. <laughs> so, yeah, which I really like. Uh, that's right. I think now we've I've done about twenty six of these, so that mm -hmm. it's twenty. The series is twenty six weeks old, and that was uh, one of the earlier ones, where I I decided rather than focus on any one homeschool family or parent, I was going to uh, uh, sort of lump all homeschool families into one piece and make the case that they're heroes. And here's why. Uh, you know, there have been so many studies over the years trying to find out uh, what correlates 
most strongly with uh, student outcomes, student performance, student test scores. Some people say, well, it's, you know, we got to throw more money at education. If we, if the government will spend more money on government schools, we can improve education. Well, we've been there, done that. Uh, we end up just, just uh, bankrolling bureaucracy and, and stupid mandates and curricula and fads and weird stuff that doesn't produce. Protectionism? Uh, other, yeah, a kind of protectionism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, and others will say, well, smaller classroom size. Well, you can make a case for that, but there's nothing that makes a, a, nothing that is uh, more strongly correlated positively to student performance than parental involvement, parents getting involved, getting serious about their children's education, helping the children uh, in the evenings with their homework, that kind of thing, and instilling in students a sense that learning is a good thing. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things we've found in recent years that most first graders start school all excited. It's a new experience. They seem to have a lust for learning or whatever's going to come at them in the school. But in government schools, by about the fourth grade, that lust for learning is pretty well bred out of them. And their, their attitude thereafter, for the most part, is how do I get out of here? It's like a prison to them. But with homes, homeschooling, this is one of the things that explains its great success uh, in this country, and that is it instills in young people more than public schools do, and in many cases more than even private schools do, this desire to learn. And that's why you know a parent who's a good homeschool teacher doesn't have to be a PhD, but he or she has to be good at encouraging the students uh, getting them to understand that this is this is not only fun, this is important, this is great, uh, you'll love it. And uh, that's why homeschool students tend to have throughout their schooling lifetime the, this great desire to learn. And they're, before, they, before they're through the 12th grade, they usually are teaching themselves more than even what their parent uh, or parents may be teaching them directly. I obviously, I, I really enjoyed this article. Um, this was actually the first one I read when I found because I had I had been to your site before and I had you know I knew I knew of you and I'd read some of your stuff in the past, but I had, I didn't know about the the hero series. So when I when I looked at it, of course I zeroed in on this because as Danilo said, um, you know I have uh, four year old twins who I had uh, I had planned on homeschooling. I'm pushing further towards the more unschooling method, uh -huh. um, which you which you actually act are, are kind of touched on with the it's the learner directed. Um, yes, education type thing with that model where you, where that that's the goal where I you yeah. know I, I I intend I always intended to teach you know help teach my girls the basics you know math reading stuff like that and then hopefully set them free and see um, because I I mean I, I think you're right obviously I mean it may be I may be a little biased because of my situation but. It, it does seem that way that when, you know, even if you do, like you were saying, you can reduce the, the size, the classes, uh, the size of the classes in public schools, even if you cut them in half of what they normally are down to 15, still 15 to one, that's yeah. still, you still have that, you know, this one size fits all model, which doesn't yeah. work when you're, when you're homeschooled or unschooled, you know, you, whether your parents are more strict with coming up with some kind of curriculum for you to follow or yeah. you or, or they let you be more free in a more unschooling model, you have that ability to be have it catered to you, which mm -hmm. in almost all cases can only be a good thing because it, yeah. it, it gives the child the potential, you know, their potential it has the opportunity to shine because you can find what they what interests them and help incorporate that that's another you know that's another thing i, I love about the the unschooling uh the, what they call unschooling method that i came across um after i'd ar already decided to homeschool um all about you know especially if you have a child who's you know stubborn for lack of a better word like i was as a, as a young mm -hmm. as a young lad yeah um you know and and or they don't they, or they don't want it that they claim they don't want to learn well you just find something that interests them and find a way to incorporate sure. that. And all of a sudden they're loving doing that. And now they have, now they have a focus. So yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's, what, that's what education should be all about. It is starting a fire in each and every person so that uh, they can learn uh, on their own and take the initiative to learn on their own. I think homeschool and, un and home unschooling parents uh, are heroes for another reason too. Think of it on the, from the financial end. They're typically paying taxes now for a system, a public system that they don't support. And they're 
shelling out their own money for resources and right. they're doing without income mm -hmm. their children so every time somebody suggests hey maybe they should get a credit on their taxes uh, because they're they're paying for a system they're not supporting they're saving that system money by not dumping their kids in it uh, you've got the teachers unions and the other uh, statists who uh, steadfastly resist that because they think they deserve to have your kid and if they can't get your kid they at least want your money <laughs> yeah absolutely. Lawrence I, uh, I posted an article yesterday it was it was the top article on um, uh, anarcho capitalist reddit posted on my Facebook yesterday it's uh, when public sector unions become voluntary more than 50 percent of the people leave so uh, what, yeah that's right yeah. so what's <laughs> gonna happen to the public schools when they just say okay yeah we'll give you a tax credit for teaching your own kid the teachers well, are gonna, gonna you to, can't lose 50 percent of your students and keep a school open that's right the school is either gonna have to improve or it's gonna have to close I mean that, that's the way it ought to be in a free market any school public or private uh, shouldn't survive uh, when if it loses its customers. I mean, that with a restaurant, people saying, I don't like this restaurant, I wouldn't go to it unless I was compelled. You give them the opportunity to go elsewhere uh, and they leave and then you want to continue to subsidize the restaurant. What What's the purpose of that? But, but people in the public school establishment, many of them think that they are entitled uh, not only to your kids but to your money too, whether they're educating the kids or not. You know, with regarding um, government school, you know, as in government in general, you know, the issue is, for me is about force and mm -hmm. voluntary interaction, right? So, you yeah. know, the child has no choice or has no say in what they learn, right? Um, if mm -hmm. they want to go to school or not, there is no choice. Um, and, and, you know, I was having this conversation actually today with, <laughs> with a woman who's considering, she's already critical of government school, but she's not like completely... Um, convinced of homeschooling and unschooling and so she's kind of teetering it's kind of interesting uh, and so because she was telling me aren't there some uh, situations where you need to force your kid to learn something <laughs> and, and, and I thought that's an interesting idea like do you, it really is there certain situations where you need to force somebody like and again I don't think you can call it learning if you're forcing somebody that's not learning that's when indoctrination someone ever, whenever right? someone makes an, outla uh, yeah. an outlandish claim like that I always say well can you name one example of, of what we need to force people right. to do you know like well we need right. to force people to pay taxes or else you know it'd be ca I'm like can you give me one example <laughs> of if no one paid taxes what would happen you know Right, it's right. the same vein, you know, oh, so, if you, we should force our kids to learn something. Well, what exactly, what's one concise thing that we should force our kids to learn? And they're going to, it's going to be another subversion and it's going to be a goalpost move. And they're not going to, they just want, some people in this world, and I, I'm just fed up today because I've been arguing with socialists all day. They just want to yeah. spit out what they want to say and they want to fucking turn around. Oh, sorry for the curse word. They want to turn around <laughs> and they want to run for the hills and go la, 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 la. They don't want yeah. to hear what you have to say back. They want to spew out the rhetoric that they've been indoctrinated to learn, and they want to turn mm -hmm. around and walk away. Like, yeah. you've got no rebuttal for that, Jack. I'm out of here. It, so it, it's it's tough to argue with yeah. people sometimes. Yeah, and sometimes they can't get past their bumper stickers. They, they're just a string of slogans. They really haven't thought these things through. They don't even realize that much of what they propose requires the use of force mm. they think well if government does it well it's democratic or right. you know we all have a say mm -hmm. uh, but the bottom line is if somebody says no thanks what happens to them somebody eventually comes to their door with a gun and mm -hmm. hauls them off to jail yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, was, I was explaining the truancy officer to some of the family members and they're like oh i never knew what those people do <laughs> <laughs> ah, no, nobody likes to talk about the gun in the room. And, 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 so, and so I was telling this woman, like, like so you're so afraid of your son um, not learning. Like, I said, what if, imagine if your son just doesn't want to learn anything you have to tell him, anything at all. He just, yeah. He's just a failure in life. Do you think you would feel justified in forcing him to sit down and, like, learn this, get this job, you know, buy this house, buy this car? There, now you're happy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine, is that the goal, right? Can you imagine if we had truant officers uh, employed by, say, restaurants or car repair shops? You know, you got to eat here. If you don't, I'm coming after you. Right. Or if you don't fix your car here instead of there, I'm coming right. after you. I mean, what incentive is there to perform if you're wasting time trying to compel people, c compel unwilling customers to buy your service? 
<laughs> yeah. I, I well, I actually spent a lot of time with my Shiron officer, who who oddly enough was actually a friend of mine. Well, she became a friend of mine later, but it was her mom, and she used to show up at my house on a regular basis because I refused to get out of bed. And I actually was a good, I actually was a, a good student for the most part. I just towards the tail end after I I, I moved mid you know mid high school, and uh, uh -huh. I just I didn't want to I didn't want to deal with it anymore. And I actually count myself lucky at this point because I didn't finish my indoctrination. Um, <laughs> But before before that happened, I, I there was a lot Your of mornings. Your indoctrination is incomplete. <laughs> exactly. There, there was well, a lot know. of. It still took me. It still took me another ten plus years to finally put all the pieces together. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm that much more well off than anybody else. But. Well, I should tell you that because this relates directly to our discussion. My earliest recollection of uh, uh, of having a, an anti-authoritarian, anti-force streak in me was uh, when I was in third grade. So I would have been about eight. Uh, my father wanted to take me to visit relatives in February, in the middle of the school year, to Florida. We lived in Pennsylvania. He wanted to take a week and take me down to Florida. And I must have said something to my teacher or somehow she got word that my father was going to take me out of school for a week. The principal called me in and I remember just being terrified. Well, yeah, we're going to Florida. Well, then I recall... Uh, within a day or two, my father got a phone call in the evening from the principal. And uh, somehow I knew who it was, or it was readily apparent early on that it was him. And I remember my dad, after listening to him for a while, very plainly saying to the principal, look, he's my kid. We're going to Florida. Don't call here again. And he hung up. And I, I cheered him on. I said, oh, good for you, dad. Well, and, uh, that's, that's my first memory of uh, standing up for our rights. Wow. <laughs> I'm trying to think. You, you rang a bell. I think it was probably when I went and hit all my dad's belts. <laughs> <laughs> probably about five or six years old. If I didn't get whipped every day, there was something wrong in the house. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I would get whipped just, just, just because I needed one that day. Well, this, the yeah. question is, did it work? <laughs> exactly. Right? I, I'll oh, I tell everyone I know, I exactly. should be in prison like nine times over, but somehow I'm not, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, right. a, I'm a lucky, I'm a lucky yeah, son of a gun. He, he's lucky more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, skill he follows luck, though, Jeremy. Always remember that. <laughs> <laughs> he must have beat you enough. You got the yes. point. You straightened out. I am a uh, deceptively good liar. So yes. there's that. Well, yeah, actually, um, well, well, just to finish up this conversation, just, I'll, I'll just say a quote that I like uh, regarding this is the, the strictest parents make the sneakiest kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, there's a streak of rebelliousness, you know, in all of us. Yeah. So uh, a typical reaction to the imposition of force is for people to find the first opportunity to go in the other direction just to prove their independence oh yeah yep. rebellious teenagers so I think we have time for one more uh, if you can talk about the missionary let's see what's it? the missionary for free markets by uh, it's Hans F. Senholtz yes he was I, I think he, he's the one that you that you met actually right you, you, he was my teacher right uh, oh wow right. economics professor for four years at Grove City College in Pennsylvania uh, he was one of only four people to earn uh, their Ph.D. under the great Ludwig von Mises, uh, oh, exactly. the dean of the Austrian School of Economics, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century. So I always felt for those four years when I got lectured by Dr. Senholtz that I was sort of getting Mises wow. uh, just <laughs> one generation removed. Yeah. Well, he was, Senholtz was terrific. He was, uh, he, he was born and raised in Germany during the Nazi years. And in fact, was drafted and forced into the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. He was shot down uh, over North Africa and ended up in an American prisoner of war camp in uh, El Paso, Texas. And uh -huh. it was in a prisoner of war camp that somebody slipped him some, some kind of free market stuff and he started <laughs> reading it. And then he got a hold of um, material by Ludwig von Mises and... He just became an instant libertarian and ultimately one of the most eloquent and persuasive free market Austrian economists in the world. And many people studied under him by the thousands at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. And there are a lot of people who are exerting influence for freedom all over the world today who were students of his. He passed away in 2007, so he's, he's gone now, but his wife is still living and she'll be 102 or 103 wow. uh, ne next month. Wow, yeah, I remember reading in in the article that uh, you know he was a great public speaker and uh, he could captivate large audiences and yes, oh yeah, it reminds me of a story. 
uh, every student of Hans Senholz has a million stories about uh, funny things he said in the classroom. He had a very authoritarian Germanic way about him and very theatrical in his lectures. <laughs> and uh, near the end of a period one day after he gave a great lecture, uh, a student who didn't know him very well said something like, well, Dr. Sendholtz, what you say sounds good, but it, 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 uh, not many people believe that. So uh, how are, why should we believe it? And those of us who knew him thought, uh-oh, he's really got to come <laughs> down on this kid. But instead, he just all of a sudden got very quiet. And then he says, you could hear a pin drop. He said, uh, truth is not a numbers game. You can be alone and you can be right. And then he paused and said, I am alone and I am right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that point that truth is not a numbers game, of course it's right. You don't count yeah. noses and decide, well, that must be true because right. the majority supports it. Exactly. It might it might have no support, but still be uh, completely true. Yeah. yeah, that's the bandwagon fallacy right there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah for I was sure. Say. Uh, that's how that's how most uh, most of our statist friends uh, live their lives. <laughs> well, yeah, they, every, everybody else says it's right. It must be, you know. That's right. And unless the majority, you know, is of a free market persuasion, then then we'll figure out some way to say that's not right. <laughs> yes. But, yep. <laughs> Yeah, you can blow a statist's mind by saying, you know, the right to vote is just legal fiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, of course, voting never guarantees uh, anything other than the guy who gets the most votes gets to hold office. But it doesn't guarantee your freedom. You can vote yourself into slavery. Mm -hmm. Voting doesn't uh, mean you're going to have a sound economy because you might be voting for somebody who will give you all kinds of uh, so, stupid socialist interventions. That, uh, so I need to go take my Bernie Sanders thing out <laughs> of the front yard? Take, take I'm, a kidding, Bernie I'm Sanders, kidding. Take a Bernie Sanders antidote somehow. So it's, uh, not let uh, it uh, there's, um, poison. There's one article on Fee that I link. I, I, it, I don't know how many times it's been shared, but uh, I've sh I, I think I've shared it over 200 times. Uh, Jeremy already knows which one it is. It's uh, the one that Thomas J. D. Lorenzo wrote about economic fascism. Oh uh, yeah, he's Tom's great. Yeah, uh, and because uh, so many people, especially my age, Jeremy's age, and and Danilo's age, they're propagandized into believe that capitalism is this one thing, this one giant leviathan beast that it's not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they go, look at those bankers, those evil capitalist bankers. I'm like, can you please point to one capitalist banker that you're referring to? Uh, That's right. The, you know, the, the CEO of Citigroup. I'm like, okay, that's, you just <laughs> said Citigroup. Citigroup is a corporation. Corporations get their corporate hood from government. So they would not exist without government. That's not capitalism. That is fascism. So, again, can you please point to the capitalist <laughs> banker that you're exactly talking about? And they can't and, and do it. And if you're truly for capitalism, real capitalism, uh, then you, you would oppose the subsidies, the special privileges, the protections, the immunities, all the goodies Lawrence, that these Lawrence, cronies, you just hate uh, the poor, man. All this stuff. <laughs> yeah, you just hate the poor. We hear that a lot, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> the poor it, it, CEO it, that drives his $500,000 car and, you know, <laughs> you just, you hate him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a never-ending string of fallacies, which gives me a good chance to, to quickly say if your viewers are interested in, you know, how do you respond to these endless uh, fallacies that progressives and socialists and interventionists uh, throw at us, we have a new book uh, uh, at Fee called Excuse Me, Professor. And you can get it on fee.org or you can get it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, all those places. Uh, it's called Excuse Me, Professor. It's got 52 chapters, and every chapter uh, deals with a particular uh, anti-free market myth and then responds to it, you know, like free yeah, enterprise caused the Great Depression or mm -hmm. you name it, 52 of them all in one book answered mm -hmm. so that uh, everyday people can arm themselves and do battle with the... Lawrence, uh, didn't you know it was that free market Federal Reserve that caused the Depression? <laughs> oh, <laughs> didn't, you, didn't you know that? <laughs> oh, no, that's Dave, one of the, that's Dave, one of the chapters in the book, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, uh, Dave, Dave, you're assuming that people know what the Federal Reserve is. Yeah. Oh, oh it's just it's like uh, it's like you know it's like FedEx and, and uh, the other federal 
companies, right? Yeah. <laughs> At our government schools tell most students, you know, probably 99% of them that, oh, the Federal Reserve helps us with the money supply. It knows just exactly the right amount that there ought to be. And it irons out the business cycle and never tells them that the Great Depression itself was caused by the Fed. And that's just as true of the other nine or 10 recessions that we've had. The Fed has been right at the center of each and every one of them with its uh, crazy monetary policy. There's um, oh, a yeah. few anarchists. Sorry, sorry. I wanted to ask this question before we, we got off the, the, the call with him. Uh, there's a few anarchists out there that are, are saying that Bitcoin could be the, the end of the nation state. Do you, do you feel that way as well? <laughs> or, or, or something like Bitcoin, something Bitcoin-esque even? Yeah. Well, I, I am excited about digital currencies because they are market generated. They're not they're not government monopolies there and their success depends entirely upon free choice. So I welcome them. And my sense is that uh, as it becomes ever more apparent over time, that government money is unreliable, subject to political manipulation and inflation over time and erosion of value. People are going to be looking for private alternatives. Bitcoin is likely to be. Uh, one of those alternatives, but there may be many others. Uh, uh, I'm kind of agnostic as to which is best. I say let let a hundred flowers bloom, let the the market decide, let anybody compete, and the market will determine which one or ones uh, or substances emerge as the best monies. Any anyone that's been a gamer like myself their whole life, you know, we were born with a Nintendo controller in our hand. We know how central planning fails every time. They yeah. may not realize that they know, but a video game creator can create the game and they can test it rigorously for hours on end. But yeah. then when they put it out on the market and 10,000 people can test it rigorously on hours on end, they find the bugs immediately. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you see with government. They can't adequately test their policies because they, they think, okay, this is going to be a good idea. Let's throw it out there. Oh, hey, 10 billion people died. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so if, if we're clever, we can probably sneak up on them. That's, <laughs> well, that's, that's the beauty not, in the open not source as smart of Bitcoin. As they think they are. Yeah. The, the open source, you know, like everyone's growing and testing and learning about Bitcoin at the same time. It's not this, hey, we got Bitcoin coming out next year. Get ready for yeah. it. It's going to be our new. No, it's like, hey, here's Bitcoin. Let's figure this thing out. And yeah. if governments did that, they probably wouldn't be so much death and destruction around the world. But <laughs> they don't because everyone in government's got to get their little, you know, they've got to get their budgets and they've got to get their control. And my authority has to overrule your authority. And it's it's they don't understand the adverse effects of their actions and how many people af get affected negatively by the choices they make. And they don't really have to care so much because, you know, they have the power to compel people. So it takes a, a lot of bad product from the government before people decide we're going to go elsewhere or we're going to rise up and tell you, you know, well, you fill in the blank. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's uh, unfortunately it seems to be taking more and more for people to realize that. We're working uh, on that at yeah. fee, and I'm I'm optimistic for the future, even though at at times at the moment, you know, you see a lot of trends in the wrong direction. But I think people are beginning to wake up. They're they're realizing government doesn't deliver the goods, uh, but it bills you anyway, and then some. And uh, <laughs> that there are right. lots of ways in which the private sector can solve problems without laundering your money through an expensive inefficient bureaucracy yeah absolutely i i try to preach it to as many people as i can i mean heck i even i, I run a small business uh here in new york and i actually yeah. took my took my business uh in a more uh agor agorist direction starting this year i started uh you know i stopped uh, i got rid of my bank accounts and i told my clients listen i i'm trying to move to i would like to receive payments in only you know digital currency or precious metals or I'll barter with you if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll still take the uh, Federal Reserve notes for now because uh, I don't, you know, <laughs> most, most people don't have a, don't have much of a, a lot of a choice. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I, I, I'm spreading the seeds with them and trying to get them to see, OK, listen, I, if I can run my business this way, then there's no reason why you couldn't do the same thing. And so yeah, and the next person do the same thing and that just spread the message is that any way you can. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> Absolutely. If we can get more young people interested in entrepreneurship, starting their own business in spite of the government obstacles, I think that's part of the key to, to restoring a free society. When people start to realize, hey, you know, I can I can benefit myself if I create something and serve others in the process, why isn't that a better way to deliver the goods than sitting back, paying taxes, 
at the point of a gun and expecting some bureaucrat or politician to solve our problems for us. That's the least efficient way to get anything done. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think yeah, um, yeah. so. we'll uh, deliver our closing remarks. Um, Lauren, thank you very much for coming on the show. Really, hey, my pleasure. It's Thanks great. to all three of you. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm definitely um, gonna read a lot of your stuff. You, you're most gracious with your books. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get on that. <laughs> I, I have the excuse me, professor, and I think that um, even though you went through 52 um, statist arguments, that's just like touching <laughs> just the surface. The <laughs> <laughs> touching the surface. <laughs> you know, like they. What was? What is? Um, uh, I think it's Albert Einstein. He says there's uh, there's two things that are infinite: the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. Well, statists are like that. I mean, it's like playing playing uh, whack a mole. You can beat them down, you can prove them wrong, but they just pop back up again somewhere else. So you, it's a yeah. never ending never ending job. <laughs> actually, you could even say whack a terrorist because every time you actually because ten 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 come out when you whack one, right? But, right. <laughs> but yeah, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Wonderful conversation. Uh, we will keep in touch definitely. Um, so yeah. Okay. Thanks, I, uh, guys. Thank you so much for coming on, Lawrence. It was a pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure. Well, hey, Thanks before we get off, what's your favorite quote of all time? I ask every one of our guests. Uh, favorite quote of all time. Boy, that's so oh, I would say but this is certainly one of them. Uh, it comes from Frederick Bastiat, who will be the subject of tomorrow's Real Heroes essay. And it's the last thing he said in his great book, The Law. And I may not get it exactly right, but this is pretty close. He said, and now that the legislators have, and the do-gooders have uh, imposed every scheme imaginable, let them end where they should have begun. Let them try liberty. <laughs> and I right. think, isn't that powerful? I mean, they right, right. have all these stupid schemes imposed on us. They never work. Government's always reforming because nothing worked before. Right. <laughs> uh, why not try liberty instead of another scheme? I, Excellent I, advice. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just quickly say, I, obviously, I, I appreciate you coming on as well. Um, I actually, I went out and uh, I, I grabbed the, the Kindle version of "Excuse Me, Professor" after I heard oh, you, you after I after I heard the, the your discussion with Danilo when when he talked about. It, I'm like, that's great. I gotta I gotta add that to my list. And, um, <laughs> well, it's, it's on my list as well. Yeah, I can't wait. I, I would always, yeah, okay, Dave. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also I would also like to encourage everybody if you if you don't know about fee.org yet, definitely get yourself over there. If you do and you don't know about the real hero. Um, series, uh, I would highly encourage people to check that out as well. Like I said, um, I've now read at least four or five of them just in the past few days alone, and I want to finish the rest of them because I'm a huge history buff, and uh, I, I love finding these stories that I, I haven't heard before, um, and uh, it, it's really great stuff, so I highly encourage people to check it out. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Danilo. Yes. Thank you very Appreciate much. Thank you very much. Yep. So, so this is... Um, hey, so hey, Go ahead. Before we before we get off, yes. I want to give a shout out to all of our patrons on on Patreon.com. Uh, uh, I want to give a shout out to Jonathan, uh, Sean, Jesse, Angus, and and, and Dylan. I uh, really appreciate you guys donating every every month. Uh, just that one dollar a month helps. Yes, thank you very much. You want to help us? Like, comment, share, subscribe. That helps. You know, you can also donate. You know, gold, silver, Bitcoin, or Patreon. Um, but you know, just uh, spreading the message is uh, what we really want. So, uh, Lawrence, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Wonderful My conversation. Pleasure. So, this is um, uh, Seeds of Liberty podcast. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Peace.